Hey there cats and kitties, I am the Blues Man, Johnny Blues, and seeing as this video, as of the time of this recording, is my 666th video uploaded, considering the ages old superstition surrounding that number, suggesting it's indicative of evil, I got to thinking, to sort of commemorate such an achievement, what better time to discuss some of my favorite villains, reviling foes that I love to hate. So in the form of this pseudo top 10 list, here are 10 that fall into that category. Coming in at number 10, Judge Doom, as portrayed by Christopher Lloyd in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. To me, you can't get much more sinister than a toon who disguises himself as a human and a judge and is hell-bent on the destruction of Toontown and essentially genocidal against his own kind. But if you should doubt his being truly evil by those facts alone, probably the worst thing we witness him do in the movie is sacrifice little toon shoe in his heinous invention, Dip. As a kid, seeing those sad, pleading eyes of that little shoe as Doom forces it into his dripping concoction, it always sent a shiver up my spine and even made me a little sad and teary-eyed as a kid. It just horrified me. Coming in at number nine, General Tesler is voiced by Lance Henriksen in Tron Uprising. Tesler was a general in Clue's army, sent by Clue to take over and occupy a section of the grid known as Argon City. In a particularly dastardly turn of events, we see just how ominous and evil he is through the second-hand eyes of Paige, one of his underlings who has doubts about her station at his side. This involves Paige's having saved the lives of two ISO refugees at some point in her past, one being Korra, who we later see in Tron Legacy, without realizing they were ISOs, programs Clue has declared war against. Paige soon learns of their program status and reluctantly tries to hide them, but Tesler, having grown suspicious of Paige, sends Recognizer to intercept the clinic they're holed up in. Korra subsequently knocks Paige out to keep her from enduring further suspicion, and when Paige wakes up, the clinic is in ruins, and many programs have been derezzed. Tesler manipulates Paige toward his and by degrees Clue's side by suggesting the destruction was carried out by the ISOs, showing him to be a hate-filled, calculating monster, definitely not to be trifled with. Coming in at number 8, Bleeze from Red Lanterns. As DC's New 52 Red Lanterns opens, Bleeze is the second-in-command of the Red Lantern Corps leader, Atrocitus. Fearing, though, that he has become complacent and unsure of his ability to fruitfully determine how best to carry out his vengeance on the wicked, he plunges Bleeze into the harsh and smoldering blood ocean of their home planet Ismalt, so that she may be given, should she survive, a level of intelligence beyond her as yet stammering, rage-filled, instinctual senses. Bleeze successfully attains this level of smarts and is soon forced to relive and confront her troubled past, wherein we find that she was once a great Havanian beauty of some renown. She was sought after by many suitors whom she paid no great amount of compassion in turning away, and was one day sold, for all intents and purposes, to a Sinestro Corps baddie who led to her being tortured and defrocked of her beautiful wings. After her dip in the blood oceans gave her back her intellect, her rage now knew focus once again, and in a stunningly brutal display we see she and Atrocitus set out to attack the men who once gave her up, one of which she beheads with her bare claws. This coinciding with her unfolding distrust and disrespect of Atrocitus and subsequent usurping of his control over the Red Lantern Corps shows her to be a force one wants not to reckon with. Coming in at number 7, Zod, as portrayed by Terrence Stamp in Superman 2. The simple fact that Zod's presence and abilities alone at one point in Superman 2 lead Superman to flee for the sake of surrounding innocence is indication enough that his power was great even before he was freed from his Phantom Zone prison and made his way to Earth where he, just as Kal-El himself was, became enhanced by our yellow sun. In those opening moments of the film when he issues his commanding threats against Jor-El and any and all of his heirs, you believe in the rage behind his eyes and know for certain he'll go to his death seeking to carry them out. Ominous indeed. Coming in at number six, Magneto, as portrayed both by Sir Ian McKellen and Michael Fassbender in the films X-Men, X2, and X-Men First Class. From his hatred of all humanity, whom he sees as inferior, and his subsequent manipulating of the mind of Charles Xavier whilst connected to Cerebro, in the hopes of eradicating the world of all humanity, to his lustful vengeance carried out against Sebastian Shaw, the man who murdered his mother in the hope of teaching the young Eric Lencher, a.k.a. Magneto, to develop his abilities in controlling these magnetic forces, we see a man determined and focused in his every pursuit. Though his actions and goals be those to be dreaded and feared, he is ever unflinching 
coaching and his certainty that they must be carried out to serve a greater good as he sees it. And not more menacing a villain's motivations and determination can there be. Coming in at number 5, Sephiroth from the Square Enix game Final Fantasy VII and the full-length CG animated sequel film Final Fantasy VII Advent Children. Sephiroth was said to be the most powerful warrior in the Shinra Corporation's militaristic elite known as Soldier, who one day uncovered the secret truth that as a child, he was subjected to genetic tests relating to an alien life form known as Genova. Upon this realization, he determined his destiny was to be that of a god who would take control of the entire world, which was the shared goal of the alien Genova ages past. In his carrying out of this ultimate plan, he is seen to have murdered the residents of and burnt to the ground an entire village and later, as he sets upon the group of protagonists in the game's story, he ultimately ends up killing one of them, Aerith Gainsborough, in what is, for most gamers, a heartbreaking and unforgettably shocking scene. Though bested by in-game hero Cloud Strife, Sephiroth later appears in a briefly reincarnated form in Advent Children at the hand of one of his three air quotes remnants, known as Kadaj. Once again, Cloud manages to defeat him, but not before Sephiroth's taunting that he wishes to gift Cloud despair, his ego being equal equal to his maliciousness. Coming in at number four, Khan Noonien Singh is portrayed by Ricardo Montalban in the Star Trek original series episode Space Seed, as well as the film Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Khan was the product of late 20th century genetic manipulation. At once fast rising to power, he succeeded in holding rule over a large portion of the Earth before being effectively chased off into space by a sleeper ship that wouldn't be seen again for a couple hundred years. Not until Captain James T. Kirk and crew would encounter his ship, the SS Botany Bay, on one of their patrols in the sector of the galaxy. Khan was automatically revived and what followed was a systematic study and takeover of the entirety of the USS Enterprise, his intellect and cunning much an equal match for Kirk and crew. And equal to this was his suavity in the pursuit of one of the ship's historians, Marla MacGyvers, who he would later take as a wife. His willingness to suffocate every last one of them until he got the information or control he desired showed he was no stranger to brutality, and that he was used to getting his own way. Kirk, though physically inferior and nearly incapacitated, was equal to the task of besting Khan, if only temporarily, as years later Khan would be freed from the ill-fated city Alpha 5 where Kirk left him, bent on carrying out vengeance on the now Admiral Kirk. Khan, though older, is no less wiser and with ease manages to usurp command of the USS Reliant, which he later uses in an on-again, off-again shooting match chess game against Kirk and Enterprise. Khan was eventually bested by Kirk again, but not before leading Spock to sacrifice himself to save the ship's complement, ultimately hitting Kirk where it hurt the most, making Khan one hell of a foe. Coming in at number three, Darth Vader, as portrayed primarily by David Prowse and voiced by James Earl Jones in the original Star Wars trilogy, as well as Hayden Christensen in the prequel trilogy. Vader was born Anakin Skywalker, a child who would later be mentored by Jedi Knights Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan Kenobi. But in his rise to power as a Padawan, great fear and doubt did linger within him, so much so that he was the constant focus of reprimands by the Jedi Council. Later, his apparent leaning toward those aspects which easily led to the dark side of the Force would be picked up by Darth Sidious, a.k.a. Palpatine team, the eventual usurper and ultimate leader of the all-consuming empire. Under Palpatine's command, Vader slew many of the Jedi, including, in a particularly heinous act, a group of Jedi younglings, or children. His reputation as a ruthless commander and cunning strategist would precede him as rebels against the Empire eventually surfaced. Little did he expect to find that two of those rebels would be his twin son and daughter, Luke and Leia. Yet, brought to the brink of darkness at the behest of the then-Emperor Palpatine, he very nearly murdered Luke, but as a result of Luke's faith in him, he averted the dark side's grasp on him and disposed of Palpatine instead in one final courageous act. Perhaps most ominous, though, was Vader's appearance, an all-black cybernetic bodysuit and compelling yet frightening helmet, a guise made all the more disturbing by the wheezing rasps of his troubled breathing inside it. The Force, whether light or dark, was most assuredly strong with him. 
Coming in at number two, the Daleks, the great pepper pot looking foes of the Doctor in Doctor Who. The Daleks share with Darth Vader a compelling yet somewhat disheartening appearance, as well as a distinctive sound when uttering commands or any number of other vocal rebukes, as at their heart is a malignant sense of disdain for any and all creatures seen as impure, which translates to being anything not Dalek. And though ruthless in their carrying out murders of the unlike en masse, there's something almost comical about them to me. Born out of the mind of the physically disabled yet intellectually propelled Davros in the planet Scar distant past, as a means by which to fend off the warring nation of Thals, the Daleks would eventually cut down even their perpetual father figure as he too did not conform to their skewed ideal of perfection, showing them to be an unflinching threat no matter how often the Doctor is able to best them. And for that, I love them. And finally, coming in at number one, that all-time criminalistic clown, Batman's arch-nemesis, the Joker, as portrayed most notably by Cesar Romero, Jack Nicholson, Mark Hamill, and Heath Ledger in various Batman-related film and TV incarnations. Joker is perhaps most reviling for his utter lack of predictability. He is truly chaos incarnate, no matter the iteration. His pale expression, emerald quaff, and ruby-red smile serving largely as the punctuation to his inexplicably undeterred psychosis. He is singularly responsible, depending on what history you follow, for the paralyzing of Batgirl Barbara Gordon, the death of former Robin Jason Todd, the drug deaths of nearly all of Gotham's citizens, as well as the murder of Bruce Wayne's romantic interest, Rachel Dawes, and the physical scarring and subsequent mental breakdown of Gotham DA, Harvey Dent. Just, I might add, to slight Batman's constant quest for justice and the greater good. Joker is a cosmos unto himself of visceral ferocity, and hands down my all-time favorite villain that I love to hate. And so we come to the end of this top 10 list of insipid devilry, if you will. I'd love to hear from you guys in the comments below who are some of your favorite villains, whether in comics, movies, anime, or what have you. And otherwise, for now, that'll be it for me, so... What's this? I haven't made the top 10 of the vilest villains of all time. I'll get you next time, Blues Man. Next time! I hope you're all doing well. I hope you enjoyed this, and I'll catch you all later. Peace.